Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Marina um, and I'm the president of the Birmingham Architectural Association and this is our fourth resilience event called Redefining Fundamentals. Um, if this is your first BAA event and you're not familiar with us, we're the Birmingham Architectural Association and this is a local branch of the Ariba um, of RIBA and it was founded in 19, um, 1874 and we re relaunched about three years ago. We are represented by architects, interior designers, architectural technologists, engineers, and um, many more from the built environment and professionals in the local area. Um, we're run by a community um, of people from different practices around the city and our aim to prom promote, support, and share knowledge through our community. Um, just to let you know of our upcoming events, um, so on Wednesday 16th, um, we have uh, Brum Architecture's sustainability series with Brum Green, um, which is with the com West Midlands Combined Authority, um, and to talk about their environmental recovery plan. Um, so join the committee members Georgina, Matthew and Katie and Rob Neal on Wednesday 16th to discuss how they are planning to um, talk about the 2041 climate change strategy plan. Um, and our special guest will be Jacqueline Homan, who is the head of the environment of the West Midlands Combined Authority. Um, Jacqueline will be giving an overview of what the WMCA and their latest report on how green will feature in the heart of recovery plans to reach the zero net carbon emissions by 2041. Um, otherwise, on Sunday, the 27th of September, we've got our Calling All Creatives from Architecture Design Competition deadline. We've had fantastic submissions, which is a competition for students, professionals and families to explore what home means to them um, and showcase their design work with opportunities to win prizes as well as just show the creativity of the city um, and share that. Um, and as usual, again, for the last six months, we've been donating to ABS, which is the Architects Benevolent Society, thanks to our sponsors. And we continue to do that and really urge you uh, to contact them if you've got um, any additional support that you need. Uh, they're a fantastic charity. Um, so the BAA is supported by a number of partners and sponsors. And thanks to these organisations, we're able to deliver a huge programme of events and activities all year round. So I'd just like to say thank you to Alamir, Ipstock, Marley, Delta Light, FRA, Taylor Maxwell, All Good, Armitage Shanks, Millican, Kitchen Gallery, Outro, Rainers, and we're very lucky to have these great supporters. So I'll let Mark Kelly introduce our special speaker tonight. He's an architect and committee member. Thanks, and over to you, Mark. Thank you, Marina. Today we're being kindly joined by Peter Inglis, practice leader of Cullen Studio. Peter is passionate about innovation towards finding better solutions for the way we work and the way we live. He has 25 years of experience at Cullen Studio working with a wide range of clients to find elegant solutions to complex and technically challenging projects. He is one of three practice area leaders with a focus on business planning and organizing project processes alongside his keen eye for detail. Peter believes that to make better buildings, we need a fully integrated collaborative approach between designers, clients, and constru constructors from project inception through to occupation. Putting theory into practice, he is currently a project board member of the UK's largest IPI, which stands for Integrated Project Insurance Project on the Institute of Technology at Dudley College. This project currently on site is a model to enlighten procurement and it has the potential to transform the way we design and construct buildings. Peter is also involved with mentoring the next generation of built environment professionals and other companies considering employee ownership as part of our responsible business commitment. Thank you, Peter, for joining us today. So, um, thank you very much for in inviting me along this evening uh, to, to be part of this talk. And I think resilience is, is one of these um, subjects, obviously, we're all having to um, grapple with at the moment. Um, 
Oops, sorry. So this um, this artwork, I think that everybody's probably seen on the flyers that the VA have sent out and kindly kindly drawn by, um, is it Tim at the, the BA? Shows this this picture of the lighthouse. I was kind of staring at this, trying to think what what um, you know what this meant. And and the more you look at that picture, the scarier it gets with this huge wave crashing towards a uh, lighthouse. And and lighthouses, obviously, you know, we we think of them as being buildings that are you know robust, that are resilient, that stand up to all weathers, um, that have been there for centuries. And no matter how bad it gets, they stand stead forth. Uh, shining a light of or a beacon to everybody all around to, to kind of you know have have that uh, to try, pull people into safety and it, it actually reminded me a lot of one of um, Ted Cullinan's first projects that he did in the in the 1960s which was uh, the, the the slides on the right which are of Bell Tooth Lighthouse which stands at the edge of Beachy Head on the south coast of, of England um, and it's a building with very robust detailing and uh, hard materials that are, that, are, that are kind of designed to be resilient in all weathers. Of course, um, what happened to, to this building was um, the, the cliff got closer and closer and closer to it so that uh, where it was 30 metres away from the cliff when it was, um, when, when Ted did the intervention in the 60s, um, by the time it got to the late 90s, the cliff had got within four metres of the edge of the, the foundation of the original tower. And the client at the time, or the, the owner of the building, had to take the decision whether to stand robustly against the cliff like it always had done, or whether to do the unthinkable and move the, move the lighthouse. And the lighthouse was moved in its entirety with its addition back 30 metres back from the cliff edge. So I think that's our, our kind of metaphor, and that, that's part of part of what resilience is: is it's it's knowing what your robust foundations are and making sure you're strong enough to stand up to whatever the world throws at you. But it's also knowing when it's time to it's when it's time to move that lighthouse and, and, and rethink what you rethink your principles. So I guess that's what we you know we've been doing recently, like how resilient are our fundamentals, and this. The practice that uh, I'm one of the, the, part, the, the partners in um, has been around for 50 years and um, we, I think we have to see ourselves as custodians of a, of a, a partnership rather than um, you know, we're not owners of it, we're, we're sort of just there for the moment of, of something that may, may well outlive us as well. Um, but we keep looking back to what uh, Ted Cullinan and his partners wrote nearly 50 years ago in 1973. They, they wrote a kind of manifesto about what they what they considered architecture and practicing architecture to be all about. Um, and this poster that they're working on here um, is still on our in our wall in our office. Um, and it's it's a picture of, of of people writing this out before before I was born, before many of the many of the current partners in the practice were born. You can tell it's the 70s because the architects are stripped to the waist. Um, but it's worth having, it's worth kind of having a look at this a little, in a little bit of detail. Um, so what this says is that the design of buildings is a social act. And if it's to reflect concern with the rest of society, um, let's move this out of the way, social relations and the hope for the future, it seems important to us that the social and financial organisation of the group should match that concern as far as possible. So from the start, Ted was concerned that how the practice was set up should be in tune with the people it's designing for, the, the, the community um, it's working within. And design and building of necessity involves cooperation. And then this is where I think you can see where Ted comes from, where the architect, master, and his servants cooperate as to the employers of corporate or state design organisation. But one is distorted by individual possession and the other by rule and anonymity. And what this means is that Ted had, had worked previously um, in commercial practice 
and uh, but also with Dennis Lasden. And Dennis Lasden was very much the architect master, and the people that worked with him were his servants, cooperating with him. And what Ted had noticed is that a lot that there was a lot of waste in the process. That the architects there were very very good architects. The design was great, but they knew that they, that in the end it was Dennis's company that Dennis owned it, and no one was ever going to be a partner in in his company because he didn't he didn't do partnerships that way. And what that led to was people leaving, people having simmering resentments and a certain cynicism that went on within the practice. And so Ted and the, the group that set the practice up decided that they, when they, they would start off on a completely different footing, that, 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 that there wouldn't be a, a single master um, and certainly not a, an ownership model that meant people were hanging around um, not being productive within the company. So of course this is written in 1973, so it says for eight years now we found that the special contributions of eight individuals find the best combined expression when the cooperative idea is paramount, supported by a shared concern for the quality of the work we do, as well as the will to share it and the money. And I think this is something that's also very, very important for when we're looking back at this now, that the cooperative idea is not the end in itself, but it's merely the means to the end, which is what the quality of the work that we do. So we've always been very clear that that's our, that's, our, that's our benchmark. That's what we always have to look at. Is the work that's being produced of sufficient quality? And is, is it being hindered in any way by the way that we're set up? And if, if, if something's not working, we can change it. But um, something that we have kept very much going is that principle that fees are shared in agreed proportions as and when they're received, that any surplus is shared out or used otherwise by agreement. Now, in, this, in the days of um, the practice in the 70s, apparently this was literal. A cheque would come in and the, the, the money would be dished out to the people in the practice. And I presume when a bill came in, similarly, they, the cap went round and did that. We don't quite do it that way now. Um, but we still have a, a a system whereby our, our pay is dynamic and related to the money that's coming into the practice. Um, and the last bit there about making the practice have no book value ensures that it's no one's possession, nor is it any, nor is anyone its servant, um, was a founding principle that people didn't hang on waiting for a bonus or, the part, or waiting for a kind of payout of a partnership. It was, a, it was designed to, to stop the barriers that were there um, to partnership that stopped pe good people joining because they couldn't afford to buy into partnership and similarly it stopped people leaving um, and people that really didn't want to be there anymore that were, were hanging around for a payday so it was very much set up in a way to make it easy come easy go um, and so where are we now in 2020 well we, we still consider architecture to be a social act we're still organized on the cooperative model and the salaries are still based on an open and dynamic income share um, on a maximum three to one pay ratio. So the lowest paid person in the practices cannot be paid less than a third of the highest paid person. And the model is still just the means to the end of the quality of the work. So we, we do need to keep changing and adjusting to the here and now. Um, and, and there have been events in the recent past that have meant that we, we have had to we, we look at what, um, what some of these early principles actually mean. So I think that the purpose of having a, the, the resilience talks at the moment is very much to do with the current COVID crisis. But I think, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested in other people's opinions, but it's felt like there's been, a, we're kind of 10 years into the, the current challenge that really the banking crisis of 2008 and austerity that hit straight after it, um, has kind of just kept the issues that these have raised have just kept rolling rolling on and COVID is the latest of this. Obviously 10, 10 years ago uh, we were working on building schools for the future schemes and had I think probably the most difficult day that I can remember in the practice when five projects disappeared in, in a single afternoon. Um, this is one Shenley Academy Academy in the in, in Birmingham was is one of the few 
ESS schools that, that survived from, from the and what we were doing at the time. And that was a very, very challenging time for the practice. And obviously we've had, recently we've had the 2016 referendum and the political uncertainty that went around that um, kind of either side of that referendum, really six months before and six months after, where clients were very reticent to make decisions of moving from one stage of the job to the other. And um, within, that, within that period, we, we were designing and building the National Automotive Innovation Centre of Warwick, a project where the clients were, were committed to um, seeing, that, seeing that building through. But I think I, I kind of often wonder if we were six months behind on, on that project, whether, whether it would, have, would that still have been the case. It's, it's one of these unknowable things. And certainly other projects that were a little um, later in the planning and um, fell by the wayside around this time while we couldn't, um, well, our clients couldn't commit to, to um, proceeding with them. And of course, recently we've, we've and, and still have COVID-19 as a challenge. Um, I think we've been lucky this time that very, very few of our projects have actually been affected by that, but certainly the project, one of the big flagship projects we had, which was ready to go on site in March um, in the, the aerial walkway in Leicestershire. Um, there is no leisure industry this year. Our, our client worked out very quickly. So this project is on, is on hold now, um, ready, to, ready to go uh, when they see a viability for their, their business again. So I think this time has really given us a, you know, it's, it's made us redefine what are our fundamentals. And uh, we've been doing a lot of work on, you know, what are we for? What is our purpose? It's fine to say that we're, we do you know, great architecture. I mean, which architect doesn't say we do great architecture? You wouldn't really post um, the opposite of that, would you? Wouldn't say we do rubbish architecture and expect to win very much. But it's, it's really looking back to, to what underpins all our work um, and what, what sort of what motivates us and, and, and trying to make that connection with clients that, that might have the same, the same motivations, that might see the value in, in coming at design from a, a particular direction. I mean, uh, and that's, that's, that's really worked for us, I think, as we've had uh, um, our, our sectors that we traditionally work within are, um, are up and down with uh, you know, the nature of the current crisis. So, but having defining the build, our buildings as having a connection to nature, take one of these examples, meant that we could talk about our, um, this is a visitor centre that we, we did at um, Hyde Hall in Essex. Uh, the visitor centres are things that, that we've done as a um, as a kind of typology, but it's not it's not a typology that is currently um, people are thinking too much about. Have a lot of these areas have, have you know that it's the last it's the, the last thing that they're investing in at the moment. But by talking around uh, around the connection to nature has allowed uh, people who have worked with us on this this project and clients see how we can we can potentially. And relate this to other sectors. So we've, we've recently been asked to look at a feasibility study for, for a care home, something that we've never, never done before, but coming, being able to transfer a lot of the ideas that we're working with this, this visitor center trans, transplanted into um, the priorities of this particular client with, with their care home. Our people are really important. And I think that understanding that has been very easy for us all to sort of within this period to, to regress into our own little bubbles and, and remembering that the power of the collective in terms of thinking, thinking out and, and seeing and seeing where opportunities are is very, very important and making sure that, that our people are um, empowered all to go out and find work, to, to bring it in and feel that it's being part of their, it's part of their company, it's part of their future. Um, and Fundamentals within this 10 years, one of the big ones is, is that it is removing that idea that we, we, shouldn't, hold, we shouldn't carry money, we shouldn't carry cash, that, that it's, about, um, it's about the here and now of, of, of working with um, the income as it comes in. I think what we've seen is that we can, I can very quickly get you into to trouble if you don't have a, um, 
we don't have a, a kind of ready a ready pile of cash effectively that, that when you get sudden jolts to the system having um, cash in hand is incredibly important in order to give yourself time to turn around to refocus to um you know to keep going and to, to invest in what the next you know the next uh, thing is and that's something that, that i think when it's when it's come to COVID has been very very helpful in in, in seeing us through this period um, I think as well we've got kind of trying to work out where where the value is. You know what what is where where is the value in in our practice? And I think we've found some really interesting ways to look at that through different types of collaboration that we've been working on at the moment. The, there's a, a, a project here which is uh, working with Innovate UK Research Money, looking at um, initially looking at how we've used. Uh, waste heat from the London underground to provide community heating and this is working in a, obviously something that, that has, is a very engineering led project but um, has a huge interface with community existing communities um, and, a, and a, a huge impact on quite a large area of the built environment so skills that we would have as architects doing master planning um, but also in consultation and communication of, of proved within this, this very, very diverse team that, that we're part of um, to, to prove very valuable in being able to um, engage the community and, and, um, and, and, and help them understand how, as well as giving um, very low cost heat, very green, uh, green energy, actually how that will, will impact their uh, you know, daily lives, things that the engineers are maybe less able to um, communicate in a way that doesn't doesn't scare people and and the projects that uh, was mentioned right at the start at, at Dudley College we've um, been working there on on an IPI method of procurement and integrated project insurance and effectively that that means we as architects are um, in contracts alongside the contractor alongside other consultants alongside subcontractors with um, a shared risk, shared financial risk in the project. And what that's allowed us to do is all sit in a room right at the start and agree with each other where each of our companies can give value to the process of building a building. So rather than it being being a process where a design and build a design and build contractor is um, trying to load risk and at the same time uh, push down cost. This is a, a kind of open and honest conversation about what do we as a company, we as architects, add usefully to the build process and where, is, where are certain tasks that might be done traditionally by engineers or architects or contractors, where do they best sit? And what we found in this actually is that um, areas that we wouldn't usually do or would usually say that's not part of our scope because of these being pushed down are things that the, the client, the contractor are actively wanting us to do and, and paying us to do. So within, within this process, a very efficient process, we are actually finding that um, the scope that we have as an architect is higher than we would um, have on previous buildings. Um, and we're being paid for it. So I, I think it's, it's also it's a way of understanding that we don't need to be, you know, where we think our value is is not necessarily where the rest of the world thinks our value is. But if we can identify that and be paid for it, then, then you know that's that's something really, really worth understanding. And I think the other, the, the last fundamental that we're we're questioning and in, in, in trying to be a resilient company going forward is where do we need to be? We've always described ourselves as working in a single studio in London, of saying that this uh, single studio model allows us to um, communicate better allows us to have all our knowledge in one place and, and um, share expertise from one project to another. But obviously, we've been in a position, same as everybody else, where instead of having one office, we've had 30 offices, um, and not all of them in London recently. And actually, it's worked just fine in terms of a lot of, a lot of the communication. Um, there are things that are problematic have been problematic that, that, that I think we but, but I think we all recognize that we're going to be in some kind of hybrid model of working from home and working in offices going forward 
and that sort of allowed us to think about well where where should the office be and we've had a problem um, as a London practice for a while partly as a perception of being fancy London practice um, losing opportunities um, in, in the Midlands and other parts of the country where we could long-standing clients who kind of don't want to bother us because we can do this with a local practice and, and I think um, we kind of want to push that perception that we, we can we can be national we can be local um, and we've also had issues with people frankly finding London a place they don't want to live anymore and moving back to uh, moving back to the Midlands and so we've taken the opportunity to decide that that when we go back to the office that we will be having more than one office and we will be having an office in, in the Midlands in order to better sort of serve our, our clients in that area. So I think, that's, I think there are great opportunities there to, 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 to just to rethink where we are and who we work with and where our collaborations might be in, in, the, in, the, in the Midlands area going forward. So I think it's a kind of quick whiz through a, a sort of primer really on what where we think we are with um, resilience, but it'd be really um you know, be kind of really interested to have a conversation with, with, with people about um, how they see it. Thank you for a fascinating presentation, Peter. Um, we have a quick question. Um, can you tell us a little about your journey to becoming the practice area leader? Studio. Oh, blimey. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I actually went, I applied to Cullinan Studio as a Euro student in 1995 um, because I quite liked the architecture that was there and I, and I kind of quite liked the, the ethos that was, uh, that was being, um, being written about in the, uh, in the architectural review. Uh, article that I saw about the practice and, and really I think there's something just really clicked and um, going down to London from Glasgow and uh, joined the practice as a year student and really um, I've just maybe maybe it's just laziness um, but I've never really wanted necessarily to go anywhere else so I, I, I we, we have a, a the cooperative ethos in the practice is to um, make people partners of the practice after they've been there for around two years um, and we, we operate on a very equitable basis as partners. So the, the practice leadership is, is a sort of elected um, rotating uh, role within the practice. So I'm one of three current practice leaders currently. Um, and that, that sort of lasts as a role probably between sort of three, five years in that cycle. And then, and then I'll pass it on happily to someone else at certain point. Thank you. I'm going to pass over to Marina for the second question. That, I mean, that's great that you guys are so innovative with different ways of um, running a practice. Um, just the fact that you have different leadership and kind of everyone feels like they're part of the company. Um, are there ways that you've, during this period, that you've been able to balance work and life and uh, have been, been people been working from home and how have you managed to support each other throughout the process. Well, it's yes. Everybody's everybody's been working from home um, until until just a few weeks ago when we started going back into the office, um, trying to get trying to get people in occasionally uh, or back into the office on a um, part time basis. It's been a challenge, I think, for a lot like like a lot of practices. It's been a challenge to um, balance the needs for some people. Working from home has been very, uh, it's been very seamless. It's it's been placed. People have have got a place to work. They, they don't need to do the commutes, um, and that's all. That's all been great for others. Often, younger people living in smaller flats, flat share situations. It's been challenging. It's been very very difficult. And I think the people it's been most difficult for are those with with children at school who have had to be um, doing homeschooling, childminding, doing a full time job in a um, you know in a, in a in a house in in, in London or a flat in London and that's that's been that's been very very difficult and, and we've what we've tried to do is support people as best we can in that in that period and 
the the, fur, the furlough scheme's been there and, and obviously was um for, for some of the people were really asking please furlough me because I I can't look after children and um you know keep, keep working at the same time. And certainly early on in the in the, the lockdown when you know a lot of, as I say we only lost one project at the start, we had a lot of work that we had to do and we couldn't we couldn't afford to furlough people just from the point of view of doing um keeping the work keeping the work going so we kind of agreed as partners that, that for our um you know for certainly for our working parents we would have uh um we would kind of support our own part-time furlough system if you like where we um had uh allowed people to work uh three days a week say or two and a half days a week but we pay them we keep we pay them at a um, an 80 percent salary rate. So we could, as, as a group, come together and, and make that agreement. And obviously, when the part-time furlough became available later on, which effectively had that model, we could, um, we could use that, that uh, um, in a more efficient way and, 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 and get, get government support to do that. But that obviously wasn't available early on. And I think we've just had to, we, we had a, a series of um, events during the week. We'd always have a Friday lunch on a Friday. We'd have um, talks in the office to try and pull us together as an office. And we've tried to get as much as possible to replicate these or to bring other versions of these things out um, using using teams to, to keep people people involved. We, our year out students had a, one of our year out students had a, had a great idea to have a, a drawing session on a Friday, on a Friday evening. We just half, half past five, everyone could, Put their computers to one side and draw something, and that's been really successful. People have really enjoyed that. Um, I think we posted some of that stuff on on social media earlier in the in, in COVID, but but that was great because when it came to doing a competition and we were all working in our own spaces, that the confidence people had to draw things, to draw hand drawings at home, and um, you could really see that, and it really helped with the presentation the presentation work in that competition. Fantastic. I think the next question um, leads nicely onto that. Um, in a cooperative practice, what does resilience mean to you? Is it an economical, an environmental, is it a social factors? Um, and are there any factors within the, the business that you see as more important than others? Um, well, fundamentally, it's a business. we are a business. So resilience in the end is, there, it is financial even as a cooperative, we have to keep reminding ourselves that, that we're not, we're not a university, we're not, you know, a kind of a club or a society, we are a business, we're an architectural practice. Um, and we need to, we need to do all the things that uh, a company does. We need to be, um, we, we need to be viable, we need to have uh, liquidity, we need to make a profit if at all we can. It's very difficult this year, I think, for for many people to make a profit, but you know we have to keep targeting that. We have to remember that they are the they are the business fundamentals. Um, but the other the other aspects of being socially responsible, um, environmentally responsible, they are core to what what we do. And I think if, if it's one of that's again, it's one of these things that we're we're trying to do. You know, high quality work and work in the way that work as a business. Um, aligned with the, the sort of work we want to do as a practice and if we can't do that if it becomes impossible to do that within the model we've got we will find another model that allows us allows us to do it no that's really interesting that you um um and it kind of leads on as well to questions about spending money on offices you said Open it. You'd love to. Um, you're looking at opening an office in Birmingham, and you're getting a lot of um, good feedback from uh, people attending uh, today that they said they'd love to have you in Birmingham. Um, but it's interesting as people moving towards remote working that you still see the uh, the positives in having an office. Mm -hmm. um, um, I mean, how do you see uh, the future for actual office buildings and? The longer term growth strategy for your studio if it means having lo localized offices in different places yeah well, well 
I think we we we've got we have to we have to deal with this issue of what what an office means. Um, as architects, we have to you know it's a, it's a, it's a question as as designers, but we are, you know as other practices will have we have an office we have a building which is in in London, and currently it's um, it can take eighty people normally um, in the building. Um, it's had a maximum occupation in the last week of about six or seven. So it's at any one time. So it's a, it's a question that's very pertinent to us. Like how, what, how, do, we, how do we deal with that? And, and I think we, we are looking at what's our, what's our model for occupying the building? What space do we need? And, and it is a building we share with other people that we rent, we, we have rent out their space effectively, but with like-minded companies. Um, and talking to them as well about what, what their needs are going to be going forward. And it, I think it gives us opportunities to, to build on that, that model and maybe have more. There are more companies who need to downsize and don't necessarily need an office all to themselves as well. There, there's possibilities of sharing, sharing that space. And I think that's how we're looking at um, moving into, and um, potentially into to Birmingham as well, as it's, we think it we're probably, um, you know, we're talking to other people about this at the moment, but but um, sharing space with other like-minded companies because that becomes the first step to forming these um, uh, groupings, teams, and um, collaborations that, that, that we're going to need to do more and more in, in projects going forward. I think it's really exciting that you've suggested that you want to come to Birmingham. I think everyone on the call welcomes that. Um, we were interested, um, during COVID, have you find, found new ways of working? And is that something you would hope to incorporate into the new studio in the West Midlands? Um, well, it, 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 yes, absolutely. I think the, the technology, I think previously we'd have thought about, we, we've thought about this tentatively before you think about setting up different hubs and having to have something that um, you know, is technical, technologically managed independently in each hub. What we're able to do because we were working out how we, we can best work remotely is that we can kind of centralize that system. It doesn't really matter where it is. So that's, um, I think the, the, it's inevitable that, that people are going to want to be more, not necessarily be in London in the office or need to be all the time. And that's what allows you to um, have a presence where they actually physically want to be. So um, one of our partners is in the process of moving back to the Midlands. Um, at the moment, he's going to be our um, person, person in the Midlands to start with. But, it, but effectively, it's, it's an extension of what we've been doing, where people have been working remotely from the main office anyway. And it's, 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 it's just about um, allowing, rather than having just one place where we can occasionally come, you know, we can come together as a group when we need to, we can do that in two places, and eventually maybe in more places as well. Excellent, I completely agree. I'll pass you across to Marina for the next question. Okay, so um, so we talked about your staff practice a lot. I just have one kind of more question to ask about that. Um, so this is from an anonymous attendee who's asked, what's the practice retention rate? And do people tend to stay for longer and have more loyalty to the firm due to your flexibility and kind of the focus that you guys have? Yeah, definitely. Um, there are, a number of people who are, have been there for, um, you know, I've been there for 25 years, but I'm still, <laughs> there's still people who are there who, you know, a large number of people who are there who have been there from before and people who joined shortly after me are, are there as, as well. The, the people do tend to stay for a long time. Um, and it's not for everybody, you know, some people come, people come and go for their own reasons and, and that's fine. It's an easy, it's, it's easy come, easy go. We don't, I aimed anyone in who doesn't want to be there. Um, but the, the, there is a, a real loyalty to the firm um, and that uh, we had, you know, obviously uh, Ted Cullinan died last year and at his, his memorial event, the number of people who came who had been through, who had worked through the, through the practice at one, one time or another, it was, it was, there's very much a kind of sense of a kind of large, there's a family feel to it, which is, um, I don't think you get with every, Every every practice really that's something that um, and, and people people who have left have talked about trying to trying to take some of that ethos with them and it's it's not an easy thing it's not an easy thing to build. 
That's really interesting. When, when you talk about the ethos, you, you clearly have a clear set of values, um, which are really important to motivate the staff and to stay connected with the office. Um, can you elaborate a bit more on the set of values that um, underpin the way the projects work? I think that's really the, the, what we've been trying to do around really looking at what's in, what, what, what our purpose, what is our purpose. And I think it is about, um, it is about making spaces which are, are healthy, which are healthy buildings. So that, so that means buildings which are not um, polluting locally or um, at, at, a, you know, at a distance or envir environmentally friendly buildings. It's about using natural materials. It's about um, connections with the natural world. And it's thinking about, it's always trying to think about the building and its landscape and its society um, together as uh, you know, as one thing that that, it's, that we're not we're not a, a building on a plot distinct from the world round about us, um, and I think that's the, the ethos in in how we're practicing and how we want to treat each other. That's about trying to be more than just a group of people who do who do a job. It's it's about understanding that people have um, you know, broader concerns that that are valuable things they can bring to, to working in their practice. The, the firm itself is quite radical with pushing the green agenda and promoting circular economy. Um, are you concerned that the momentum of sustainability has been sidelined from COVID and Brexit, or actually the opposite has happened and it's promoting sustainability in other ways? Um, and what else can architects do beyond building green to help um, to help sustainability? Um. Well, I don't know. COVID, COVID certainly made us question a lot of, you know, a lot of um, givens that there's been a huge push within urban design towards uh, green modes of transport and um, in, in public transport, multimodal public transport, and that becomes very difficult in a COVID in a COVID situation to um, to sustain. I, I think it. I think we'll get we we'll, we will get back to that. That's um, you know, I think I think that's that's not a that's not a long term change. Um, no, I, the 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 climate the climate emergency is is still with us. We still need to we still need to deal with it and deal with it more than ever. And I think there's um, we're all sitting in our in our houses. We've all had the opportunity, not just architects but everybody else, has had an opportunity to really sit in their house and think: Is this is this really how we want to live? Um, we've had the blessing in a way of having the having a very nice very nice weather in the summer that it's been relatively pleasant and um, some people all may have been overheating in their house and wondering why why has this been built so badly and in the winter and um, if we're all sitting at home feeling very cold in our houses we're kind of wondering why things why why do we put up with this um i think the opportunity is there to really refocus on our existing the way we live our existing building stock and um if you know, if the, if the government is serious about starting the economy and, and making jobs, I think having, uh, which they've alluded to, having some kind of system where we can actually re-look at the, the buildings that we already have and what we can do with them to make them much better is something that we as architects have a big part to play in that. Excellent. I was interested in the Dudley Institute of Technology project with the Integrated mm -hmm. Project Insurance. Can you discuss the lessons learned on that project with aligning expectations and how that's advocated for increased strength on for the architect on fees? Well, it, it, I think it's about it, it's a it's a it's a project which is based on it's a it's a concept of a, a um a building contract which is based on fundamentally on fairness, and it's it's uh, about not having the current, the, it's trying to do away with the current idea of a con contract which are adversarial, where you have uh, um, you know, various different guises, whether traditional contract is a sign and build contract. It's here's a client, there's a client, and there's a contractor, and there's a whole load of um, pushing of risk from one party to another, and and onerous clauses and rewriting of clauses by lawyers, um, which are all designed around um, protecting 
one party and the other party tries to make amendments to have um, to push that risk back again. Um, and that creates an awful lot of waste. And within that process, the ar architects within that, that, that process have got professional indemnity insurance and um, the, the appointments are written in a ways to, to push a lot of the risk onto the indemnity insurance so that if something goes wrong, the architect can be sued for money. Um, and the architect spends a lot of time working in ways that we're all very used to working, which are effectively designed to, to protect us should the worst happen. Um, and the people who wrote the IPI contracts did work on within, a, within the, the overall contract, how much money is wasted in people doing processes which are all just around um, behaviours which are nothing to do with building the building but are to do with protecting positions. And the principle is if you can have one insurance policy that covers everything, you don't need to worry about that because if something goes wrong, the instinct is to work out, well, how do we fix this? What's the most efficient way of fixing this? And there's no there's no blame. It's like who's put something in the wrong place it doesn't matter because we all sign agreements that we can't sue each other within this con within the contract. And it is a revelation in, in terms of how everybody sits around the table and um, how you can have a process where things that, you know, an argument as you have on every project an architect will have with the structural engineer and the services engineer about where, where the responsibility for the pipes stop on one side or the other of a retaining wall, that kind of thing that every single project you have an argument about. You can just say, well, okay, who wants, you know, where, where's the best place to do it? Who's modeling that part of the moment? And it, it, you can decide which party is best to do it. In the end, we did it. In the end, we set out all the, um, that part of the model because it made sense with the modeling capacity we had to do that at the time. And the services engineers are reviewing it and it's fine. It's, 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 it's around, it really helps with um, you know, making an integrated BIM model if the people who are best placed to do the modeling are the people, people who do it and the responsibility shared. Um, other aspects as architects that we're valued in, we're being valued in um, the document control, for example, where the main contractor has a document controller, but they reckon our document controller can do the job for the whole project better. So we have our document controllers doing the document control for the whole job. So it, it's just it's things like that that we wouldn't necessarily have, you know, we'd have resisted that previously. And um, but because you're paid per the hour of people working at the rates that they're being paid, um it, it it's um it makes sense to do it that way. It makes sense to actually take on more responsibility. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we are running out of time, so I'd just like to leave it on, on one big high, um, which is what is the best um, and most positive aspect that's come out of both the financial crash and also um, the, the current situation that we're in now? Or maybe a couple of positives for you that have come out of the situations. Okay, um, I think what the, the, the positive has come out is people rediscovering where they live, rediscovering their um, local environments and taking an interest in it. That uh, we, I live in a, a very 19, 1930s suburb in, in North London, very nondescript sort of, sort of a place with lovely parks, which were um, prior to lockdown sparsely used and through lockdown have been discovered, rediscovered by everybody who live round about, who are using them, who are running, who are taking, who are cycling, um, and really um, taking an interest in these, these forgotten, forgotten places that I think you can see within our local high street. Um, there's, there's something different, there's something changed, there's something different about the way people use, use the space when previously they would have spent a lot of time commuting. So I think, I think that is a, is a positive, that, uh, local communities are rediscovering themselves. Fantastic, thank you. Mark, do you want to, um, I just wanted to say thank you, Peter. Um, 
we ha we try to ask all the questions. There's a couple of more, so maybe we'll uh, send them across in an email afterwards to the attendees, um, unless um, you're happy to answer them now. They yeah. were largely, um, what kind of sectors do you think will thrive and suffer in the coming year? And then, um, does building green mean less building and more repurposing of existing structures? And then I'll pass you back to Mark. Okay. Um who knows? Who knows what sectors are thriving? I can read all the, the stuff in Building Magazine about um, market sector analysis. I think we just, we just don't know. We don't know what's going to happen, do we? Um, with uh, second waves and no deal crash outs and all the rest of it. I think, I think we just have to be alert to uh, and go back to the fundamentals of you know, what do we do and, and, and find, find where our uh, skills um, have, have traction really. Um, the other, what was the second one there? The, the um, second one. Does green um, mean building less and repurposing of existing structures? Yeah, I think very much so. I think that is something that we um, are very much aware of. That it's something that's happening, isn't it? In, um, in Westminster Council in London, uh, any planning permission that goes in at the moment, you have to um, the the um, presumption is that you're going to refurb before you do new build, and if you do new build, you have to um, you have to make a a, a case for it, a, a case based on carbon and on um, and economics. But that that I think is going to become much more of the norm. That's the the, the greenest structure is going is, is in a lot of cases going to be reusing the existing structure, and and as architects, uh, no matter what the planning changes are going to be that are, are going to throw curveballs at us in terms of where our value sits in terms of getting planning permission. The, the ability to sort of use our, use our um, skills and our brains to work out how to reuse existing buildings is something I think uh, we're going to be in demand for. Great, fantastic. I think those are all the questions. Mark, unless you've got anything else. Just to summarise the other questions, has working from home affected your thinking about projects? And is the pandemic, can that be a catalyst for change? And how can we think about positives that can come from it? Oh, I think, yeah. We've addressed some of those. I think I've working from home changed the way we think about projects. No, I, I think, I think, I think, um, I think other than what we've talked about already, I don't think fundamentally how, how we engage with projects is different other than it is maybe let us question you know some of the some of the dead time we spend on projects traveling traveling to meetings and our physical meetings really so much more productive than than virtual meetings um i think we've had a lot more micro meetings with our clients so we've probably had a lot more um regular discussion with our clients rather than things being every two weeks sitting in a sitting in a room with them and i think actually that's probably been beneficial partially speaking it's brought it's brought and everybody's sitting as we're sitting here in our various rooms um it's kind of humanized a lot of people you know you realize that you know quantity surveyors are real people too and they they also have you know they have rooms that look a bit like the rooms you're sitting in so it's uh it's it's been i think that's been been quite nice it's been a leveler really um in, in terms of realizing that you're you're working with a, a group of group of humans and there's been an awful lot less sort of table bashing um sort of apprentice uh, style uh grandstanding i think it doesn't really work on a zoom meeting so i think that's been good excellent i just want to say thank you for coming to speak to us it's been a really exciting refreshing talk uh, and we're really excited that you're coming to the west midlands Great. thank you all right, thank you very much, Peter. Um, and also thanks again to all our supporters, Ali Muir, Ibstock, Marley, Delta Light, FRA, Taylor Maxwell, um, All Good, Armity Shanks, Milliken, Kitchen Gallery, Ultra and Rainers. But thank you very much, Peter, and for sharing your time and that really interesting insights to Cunningham Studios and also your own personal approach. <laughs>